Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Noah Barkin. I'm a visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund and managing editor at Rhodium Group. Uh, and I'm looking forward to what I think is going to be a very interesting discussion today about transatlantic cooperation on China. Uh, now, this is not a topic that was front and center of the foreign policy debate a few years ago, but now I think it's at the very heart of that debate as we transition to a new administration in the United States. Last month, the German Marshall Fund and the Center for a New American Security published a very interesting report on this subject entitled, Charting a Transatlantic Course to Address China. And we have two of the four authors of this report who will be presenting today at the start of a very busy week for GMF uh, with the flagship Stockholm China Forum uh, set to take place this week. Um, I'd like to welcome Julie Smith, uh, who is uh, an advisor to the Biden team, currently on leave from her role at GMF as head of the Asia and Geopolitics programs. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome Andrea Kendall Taylor, who is a senior fellow and head of the Transatlantic Security Program at CNAS. Uh, Julie and Andrea are going to take a total of about 10 to 15 minutes at the outset to present the report. Um, after that, we're going to hear a short response from Ina Eriksson Soraida, uh, the Foreign Minister of Norway. Uh, and then we're going to pivot to a discussion that will include two other distinguished guests, Tom Nides and Mike Green. Tom is Managing Director and Vice Chairman at Morgan Stanley and a former Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State under Hillary Clinton. And Mike is Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'd like to welcome everyone to the to the discussion today. Um, a little housekeeping first. Our aim it is to allow about 15 minutes for questions at the end of the event. If you have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A function in Zoom, and if possible, specify who your question is for. Um, now, because our window for questions is fairly tight, I apologize in advance if we're not able to answer all of them. Uh, and with that, I'd like to hand over to Julie and Andrea who are gonna present the key findings and recommendations from their new report. Over to you both. Great, thanks so much, Noah. And thanks to all of you for joining us uh, on this Monday morning or Monday afternoon, if you're tuning in um, from Europe. Um, we're delighted to have the chance to talk about uh, our report today and dig into some of the substance, some of the recommendations. We've got a terrific lineup, as you just heard. Very, very grateful to Minister Sarida for joining us from Oslo today. It's such a treat to see you on the screen. Uh, and also just a real pleasure to have Tom Nides and Mike Green join us as well from here in the United States. Uh, and I really want to thank all of the authors of this report. Andrea and I will be speaking just for a few minutes this morning, but I want to be sure to mention our other two co-authors, Ellison Laskowski, who's a senior fellow uh, at the German Marshall Fund, and uh, Carissa Nitschi, who works with Andrea on the Transatlantic Security Program at CNAS. So as Noah mentioned <clears throat> about, I don't know, a decade or so ago, um, many years ago, China wasn't really a feature of the transatlantic relationship. Europe and the United States were, of course, focused on a whole array of other challenges, many of which were much closer to kind of the Euro-Atlantic area. Obviously, in recent decades, we've worked on challenges in the Middle East. We've worked on broader transnational challenges like climate. We've worked on addressing Russian resurgence, um, and the list goes on and on. But over time, we found ourselves, these two transatlantic partners, coming together to talk about the China challenge. And what's happened is both sides of the Atlantic have been forced to kind of rethink their views, their policies vis-a-vis -vis China. And that stems from a couple of things. 
Number one, China has been more active on the European continent. We've seen a variety of new BRI projects surface in the periphery around Europe, and in some cases inside Europe, we've seen China more active diplomatically. We've seen a number of Chinese investments dramatically increasing really over the last 20 years or so. Um, and so now we're at the point where we're seeing much more transatlantic conversation, not just conversation, but I would say convergence. Um, we're seeing the private sector talk about China. We're seeing think tanks focused on it, governments bilaterally, also in multilateral contexts. You saw NATO recently put out its first China review. Of course, the EU is very active in this space. And so last fall, when Andrea and I were sitting around having a conversation about this, we realized that this was the moment to do some deeper thinking. I think we're at the point where a lot of events talk about the need for Europe and the United States to do more together. But when you ask folks, what does that actually look like in practice? You often, often kind of get crickets, you know, it's, it's some shrug shoulders and well, you know, maybe a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So we set to task to work on this report, the four of us together, bringing two think tanks in Washington together, GMF and CNAS, to focus on specific recommendations in four different baskets. So we looked at at trade, uh, we looked at investment, we looked at China's role in global governance, and we looked at tech. We felt like those were the four areas we wanted to take on and issue specific uh, recommendations. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andrea to say a little bit more. Great. Thanks, Julie. And just to echo Julie's thanks to Minister Soride, thanks for joining us, to all of our panelists, and of course, to our co-authors on the report. But just to pick up where Julie left off, you know, there, it, it was clear to us that there was um, increased political will on both sides of the Atlantic to address the China challenge, but then we're left, as Julie just said, of, well, what is the roadmap to do that? And so what we wanted to do and to, to identify those areas where cooperation would be most ripe, we wanted to find the convergence. And I think one of the key takeaways of that exercise and really of the report is that there is tremendous overlap between the United States and Europe. There's a tremendous amount of shared interest. And I think that's important and notable because for a long time you would hear in conversations about China, the transatlantic partners focusing on our shared history and our shared values. Um, and of course, those are important because they do create a very solid foundation for cooperation. But really, I think the, the incentive and the motivation to work together on the China challenge is about much more than just those shared values and that shared history. Um, there are actually some very pragmatic and very practical reasons that the United States and Europe needs to be working together to, to counter China. And so, as Julie said, we went and we were looking for those areas of shared convergence in all of the dimensions that Julie just mentioned. Uh, and I want to give a couple of examples of where we thought um, those, can, those interests were most converged. But before I do that, just to note that I think the, the flip side of that coin or another way to think about the shared interest is to say that these are areas where if the United States and Europe don't act together, if we don't see cooperation forthcoming, that there are real risks uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, so just to give a couple of examples, in the technology domain, uh, we, we highlight how Beijing's actions threaten to degrade US and European competitiveness. Uh, the technology that Beijing acquires often illegally accelerates its ability to innovate and it could end up shifting the military balance. We also see that Beijing's technology and its disregard for democratic norms threatens to accelerate its brand of digital authoritarianism, not just in China, but also beyond its borders. So those are all real risks. Uh, in the investment domain, for example, the CCP is restricting access to Chinese markets. It's threatening supply chains. We see that Beijing is using investment and economic power to increase its influence which has the potential to erode EU and NATO cohesion. And I think eventually you could see it, there's the potential that China's investment in infrastructure in Europe, for example, could also threaten NATO mobility. So the risks are real. And I feel like I could go on and on across each of the different domains that we address in the report. But I think that the point is, is that the United States and Europe have very real, very practical and pragmatic reasons for cooperating to address these risks and to prevent them 
from coming to fruition or at least to moderate their impact. Um, but we also recognize that there are some barriers to doing that cooperation. We were fully cognizant of that and wanted to figure out you know, where those barriers are, how the United States and Europe might be able to navigate those. So Julie, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to you to talk a little bit about that. Sure, as Andrea just mentioned, I mean, as there's been a convergence and we've seen some really interesting and dynamic conversations between Europe and the United States on China, particularly over the last two years, I would say, uh, there are barriers to cooperation. And I think we should be clear eyed about that. And you'll see that in each chapter of the report, we do specifically address some of those barriers. Obviously, we've had a bit of a rocky road to say, uh, to put it lightly, in recent years. So there is some mistrust in the relationship right now that's been built up uh, in recent years. But beyond that, we have some fundamentally different policy approaches uh, when it comes to addressing China's rise. You'll note in the tech uh, chapter in particular, we really dig into some of those um, barriers. We have some very different views on both sides of the Atlantic as it relates to data privacy. And Europeans and uh, Americans also look at things like competition more broadly and regulation more specifically through different lenses as well. That doesn't mean that we can't come together to address this challenge. I think that is possible. And, and looking at the rep recommendations in this report, what you're gonna find is kind of an array of recommendations there's a set of recommendations in the report that really are in the category of low hanging fruit, things that governments on both sides of the Atlantic could move forward with immediately. And then there are some more ambitious, longer term recommendations. I'm eager to hear the panelists view on this um, that will take time, that we're gonna have to work out uh, and work through some of our differences. So uh, in any case, uh, I'll just close out before I turn it back to Andrea, let me thank all all of you for joining us again. Very excited to hear from our panelists. Obviously, as many of you know, I am advising uh, the president-elect. Because of that, I will not be able to address any specific questions as it relates to him um, and his administration, but very much look forward to this conversation. So Andrea, I'll give you the final word. Great, and just as our transition to the panel, the final one of the final things we do in the report is to highlight a couple of principles that should guide future transatlantic cooperation on this issue. And I just wanna quickly highlight five of them. Um, the first is acting with urgency. And so the point here is we already see that China is pulling ahead in some key areas like AI and 5G. Uh, they also like Russia, I believe, uh, sense that the United States is in decline. And so they're really leaning in. And that for us meant that time is of the essence. There really does need to be some urgency behind transatlantic cooperation on these issues. Um, the second principle we highlight is that we really have to focus on strengthening our own competitiveness, both in the United States and Europe. So much of what we highlight uh, and what that we think will be important moving forward is that a lot of it starts at home. And so that means that the United States and Europe should be prioritizing uh, maintaining U.S. and European advantages in areas like technology, clean energy, AI, and importantly, that we do so while upholding underlying principles of freedom and democracy. It also means aligning investment in R&D to spur joint innovation. And it also has an awful lot to do with enhancing our own resilience. And there, again, are areas for uh, cooperation, more intelligence sharing, and more coordination along those lines. Um, the third principle is that we should aim for coordinated and complementary, if not common policies. And like Julie said, we have to be clear eyed and recognize that there will be differences, um, but the United States and Europe need to be closely coordinating on this issue. Um, fourth is that, and this is for uh, US policymakers, it will be important for the United States to engage Europe at all levels. And so that means the EU, its member states and at NATO. Uh, we know the EU will be key and we've already seen the commission has the power to shift attitudes on China. Um, but it, it's important to recognize that the EU will likely not be a one-stop shop. Some EU guidance has been unevenly implemented across member states, so it's important that the United States recognize it has to work all out, uh, reach out also to capitals. And NATO, although it has fewer tools here, it does have some, including the ability to help shape a common picture of the challenge.
And then finally, we recognize it will be important to expand the conversation and the coordination beyond the transatlantic players. Uh, there's so much to learn from other like-minded countries like Taiwan, Japan, Australia, India, Canada. And so we need to be working to do more to widen the umbrella and build the widespread coalition that will be needed to ultimately shape uh, and change China's behavior. So those are some of the principles that we highlight. And Noah, I want to turn it back over to you um, to, to kick it back to our panel and looking forward uh, to reactions. And again, just to echo Julie's thanks um, to, to all of you for joining us. We're looking forward to the panel discussion. Well, thank you, Andrea uh, and, and Julie. Um, if you haven't read the report, I highly recommend it. There are some great uh, recommendations, uh, and this report covers the full gamut of uh, potential cooperation between uh, the US and the EU. Um, I want to move on. Uh, we now are going to have a, a, a response, uh, some comments from uh, Ina Eriksson Sarida, the Norwegian foreign minister. Uh, so, Ms. Sarida, I would pass it over to you before we get into the panel discussion. Well, thank you. I hope now that my sound is on. It is? Very good. Very good. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me on this uh, morning or afternoon in, in my case. Um, I think uh, the summaries were uh, an excellent brief of the report and, and it's been really interesting to, to see it. And I think also the timing is very good with the uh, incoming Biden administration and uh, the eagerness, I think, for everyone to listen to what the, the policies will, will be. Um, to start with the most obvious thing, I strongly support uh, enhanced transatlantic cooperation on, on China issues. And I really go along with a lot of your analysis and, and also your concrete proposals uh, in the reporting. And I will not go through them in detail, but uh, I will try to bring to the table some of the um, issues where I think we both have like minds, but also where we differ a little bit. And I think that my main take on where we differ to a certain extent between Europe and the US in the China policy issue is probably on the balance between engagement and hedging against China, uh, between cooperation and, and confrontation. And, and I think that it's essential right now that we recharge the transatlantic cooperation and we have to dig into some of these differences because they are not, in my opinion, bigger than that they can be dealt with in a good way. Andrea also mentioned that uh, having these coordination doesn't always mean that we, as she said, it have complementary um, policies and, and agree on everything. That's not the goal either. But I think the enhanced understanding of our different positions is going to be important. To, to give the case for engagement with China, seen from our perspective, it stems from China's role as a major world power. We have to take into account that China is the main trading partner for 100 plus countries. It's the world's second largest economy, the world's second largest military power. And all of that, of course, plays into, into the mix. They're also key for addressing some very important global challenges. On the case for hedging against China, uh, it stems from the increased authoritarian bend of, of China. And also um, we see that there are a range of security challenges that I also see is featured well in your report. So in handling China, we will have to face a lot of very different uh, dilemmas. And for Norway, our response to these dilemmas again amounts to the word balance. On the engagement side, I mean, we continue to invest in our bilateral relationship uh, with China because we do it from a national interest point of view. Um, and we invest in understanding a very big country that differs fundamentally from our own country and from our close allies. We engage in policy dialogues. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we cover issues from economic policies to human rights. Uh, we are negotiating a free trade agreement now, uh, as are many other countries. We run thematic policy sessions on Arctic issues, climate change, uh, oceans and shipping. We compare notes on, on peace and reconciliation efforts. Uh, and of course, we are um, now also looking into how it is possible to cooperate when we enter into the Security Council on, on January 1st. Then to the hedging side. Um, 
for us, that means being agile and smart in monitoring and scrutinizing Chinese motives and Chinese uh, influence. It has to do with influence and motives on Norwegian territory, but it also has to do with influence and, and motives uh, globally. We have to cooperate very, very closely with allies, for instance, in sharing intelligence, which is a very important part of this, investment screening. We just recently renewed our, um, revised our National Security Act to make sure that it actually is able to deal with the new security challenge and new security landscape that we have. Um, it also means securing the integrity of digital infrastructure, working closely with our, our partners. It, we, it means we have to work continuously close with the OECD, the EU, the WTO and allies on what we request as reciprocity from Beijing when it comes to trade. We see a lot of distorted trade measures that are hampering and are directly, uh, I would say, undermining uh, global trade. We have to work closely with allies in, a, in order to be able to not let China water down language, for instance, on human rights, which is a major concern for, for all of us. And we also have to address security challenges uh, with China. And I say this knowing full well and also having been defense minister for four years, having China on the agenda in NATO does not mean that NATO should have a military response immediately. But it has to do with the the very simple fact that if NATO is not able to address or assess the world's second largest military power, a geopolitical uh, player that exerts more influence now than it did before, then we would not do our job, not even as a regional military and political alliance. We have to assess the whole security picture around us. That is also why we have been very supportive of the U.S. claim that China should be part of future nuclear disarmament uh, initiatives and deals, because otherwise they run the risk of being irrelevant over time. So with, will this continued um, engagement create dependencies that can threaten to undermine our hedging strategy, or is it the other way around? that consistent and, and also intensified hedging will alienate China and by that undermined our uh, engagement strategy. Well, I, I continue to believe that it's both possible, uh, but also important to uphold and to, to further refine this, this balance. I will say, however, that events over the last years have tilted the balance uh, towards more hedging. Um, the world, of course, is not black and white, and, and that is also why um, this has to do, particularly for me, I think, with political realism. I mean, China is here to stay. We cannot wish away China, um, and we have to we have to realize that China will be, uh, also in the future, a major actor in many fields. But at the same time, it has to do with values. It has to do with basic outlooks on international policies. I believe small states, like Norway, we have a fundamental interest in the multilateral system where larger powers can be held accountable for their actions, held accountable to basic rules and norms. And this is what we have to do um, together. So I will conclude then by um, going back to your report and pointing to one of the six recommendations that came in, remain open to engagement with China. Well, I think it is possible for an incoming administration, of course, to charter something that will be useful in the transatlantic uh, context. But let me just emphasize one thing before I close, one thing that has struck me over the past years um, as a foreign minister and before that also then working with defense. There is a strong need for US leadership and commitment. And one of the most stunning features in my opinion, of the China policy of the current Trump administration is that in order to confront China, the answer from the US has more or less always been to withdraw from international cooperation, multilateral organs. That of course leaves the space wide open for China to exert even more influence, filling the void very quickly 
that is not an easy task for European countries or other allies uh, when the lack of US leadership is, is there. So I think it's extremely important when we engage in the transatlantic dialogue about this, that exerting US leadership means engaging uh, in the areas where your allies are present. Uh, and by that, we can manage to do things uh, together. So I'll stop there. Well, thanks so much, uh, Minister Sarait. Lots of food for thought in your comments. Uh, I think this, the balance that you talk about between engagement and hedging is sort of at, at, at the very heart of the, the debate. Um, uh, it has been under the Trump administration. I think there is a great deal of hope that uh, a Biden administration will bring maybe a bit more nuance and a bit more, a bit more of a measured approach to the debate, which is perhaps closer uh, to how Europe feels. Um, I want to come back to you uh, on some of these issues, but I want to open up the, the panel a bit and, and go, to, uh, go to Mike and, and, and Tom. And for, first to, to Mike, um, one of the points that is made in this report is that the US and Europe have no time to waste. They need to act with urgency. Um, but this is potentially a vast agenda that encompasses security, trade, technology, human rights. It's quite daunting, <laughs> the complexity of some of these issues. Uh, Mike, do you see any sort of quick wins, you know, that the US and Europe can, uh, you know, areas that they can work on quickly uh, and, and, and show progress? What issues do you think a new administration, for example, in the US uh, should focus on at the outset? Um, th thanks, Noah. Let me first congratulate Julie and, and Andrea and their colleagues at GMF and at CNAS for the report. It really is a, an actionable blueprint for a transatlantic agenda on, on China. And in two days, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will be reporting on its uh, transatlantic strategy on China. And that's a Republican-led effort, but uh, I know a bit about it, and I think it will actually resonate quite well with um, the GMF report, which will be an indication to friends in Europe that there is um, bipartisanship around this um, set of recommendations, in my view. Um, I also um, will do a little advertising for CSIS. We published a survey on China policy of the American public and close to 500 thought leaders in Europe, Asia, and the United States. And in the areas of technology competition, human rights, um, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and even security, there is remarkable alignment among thought leaders in Western Europe, um, the US and um, countries like Japan, Australia and Korea, very, very strong alignment. And in the US, we, we surveyed across different sectors. So it's not just foreign policy elites, it's leaders in agriculture and universities. Um, so a, a real, um, I think some data to suggest that there is um, fertile ground to move forward on this agenda. But the U.S. Uh, transatlantic relationship uh, with Europe is not, you know, free of complications, and the China problem is not easy. So I would focus, Noah, on three areas where I think there, there, there is room to quickly um, get some points on the scoreboard. Um, first, um, simply demonstrating that the U.S. and Europe are aligning more on this issue is hugely consequential. Um, there are there are reports, uh, I, I've not been able to confirm, but there are reports that Kicker, the China Institute for Contemporary International Relations, the leading think tank uh, in China associated with the Ministry of State Security, they warned Xi Jinping over the summer that China's policies were going to drive the US, Europe, Canada, Japan, leading countries together to contain China or to block China. And um, whether or not that report actually got to Xi Jinping, it's very important that we reinforce its premise. And so low hanging fruit, as soon as possible, demonstrate that we are repairing the transatlantic relationship. For 20 years, Chinese scholars have argued that the world is multipolar, but they define the poles as the US, China, the EU and Russia. And, and when they talk about the EU, there's no agency. The EU is the sort of you know um, dormant elephant or something that China can manipulate. Um, we need to demonstrate that multipolarity is, um, goes beyond that and also that the EU and Europe has agency. And so that's number one, and that's not hard to do. Uh, that can be done early on. Uh, 
<clears throat> secondly, uh, I think that tech is ripe for immediate action. Um, there is a consensus about this in the Congress and in the expert community. Um, investment screening, we're already starting to align. Uh, Julie's and Andrew's report points to next steps. On 5G, our survey at CSIS showed almost identical views in Western Europe, uh, the US, Japan, Korea, Australia, uh, and Taiwan on 5G, which is to say two thirds to 80% in every country uh, said block Huawei and Chinese firms from our 5G markets. And, and slightly less than half said control exports. So there's a consensus around that. The administration has tried this clean network proposal to try to align countries around this, but it's been, it's been rushed, poorly coordinated, and it's really not moving forward. I think we do a do-over and there's an opportunity. The interesting question will be digital trade. Um, as Julie pointed out, privacy and other issues will make this slow and painful in a transatlantic context. But I think, I, I, I think early on you could see a digital trade agreement forming among Pacific Rim countries. It's already in the US-Canada-Mexico agreement. <clears throat> it's already in the US-Japan agreement. Korea, Taiwan, Australia will, will likely sign on. So I think um, digital trade within the Pacific context is the start. And then you know, with, with time, we, we move it to a global uh, agreement. And then the last one, I think, human rights and democracy. It's quite clear that Xi Jinping and the leaders in Zhengnanghai, in the leadership compound, don't care very much what we think about what they're doing in Hong Kong. Um, they just, you know, essentially fired all the opposition politicians uh, in, in the uh, Legislative Council in, in, in Hong Kong. Um, if you follow this, the Hong Kong national security law that China passed means that if I were to say right now that I support independence for Hong Kong, I could be arrested the next time I go to China. So the extraterritoriality into advanced open societies, not just in Asia, but the US and Europe is shocking. And clearly uh, the Chinese leaders don't think we're gonna do anything about it. So our survey showed a lot of alignment on this, not only transatlantic, but countries like Japan and Korea um, willing to push hard on human rights. We need to do it outside of the Human Rights uh, Council Commission. I think there's room for a coalition to address this. Uh, uh, President-elect Biden has proposed a summit of democracies. That might be the place to start this. So those are three uh, low-hanging fruits. I have other thoughts on the report, but why don't I stop there? No, it's it's a it's a you know I've I've been I was in at the beginning of the of the um, Bush administration. There were a handful of think tank reports that we actually used. Uh, to govern, and I suspect this will be one for uh, for a Biden administration. Although we're not allowed to ask Julie that. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, and I want to come back to the issue of uh, that you mentioned, the summit of democracies, because um, I think that's a very a very interesting uh, uh, issue. Whether whether this uh, this this coordination should be framed in in this way. Uh, but I want to come over to to Tom now. Um, and, and ask you, Tom, a bit about the, the barriers to a transatlantic agenda on China. Um, in particular, the risk with a new administration uh, that it's simply engulfed in domestic issues. We have record COVID-19 infection rates in the U.S. at the moment. Uh, there's talk of a double dip recession. We have a, a very deep partisan divide, which is being made even deeper by, by the outgoing president. Um, did, you, you spent time in the State Department uh, in the Obama administration. Will a new administration have the bandwidth to focus on the transatlantic relationship? Well, um, thank you very much. And let me just say it's rare that um, you can write a report uh, that actually can be used uh, with no disrespect uh, to all the reports all of us have been involved in. And, who would have figured when uh, CNES and the German Marshall Fund decided to do this that we would be fortunate, putting it on my democratic hat here, to have a president, new president-elect, who can actually take a document and pick and choose the things that they will want to use. So I commend um, everyone who worked on this. It's enormously thoughtful. And and before I answer the, the, the question, um, let me just say that the two things which I found really, really important in that report are the idea of not, let's not play total defense here. We need to play offense. And I think the uh, incoming Biden administration gets this. And that means everything from making big bets on technology with AI and 5G 
uh, through the use of the Defense Department and through all of our, our abilities to do that, to really work on the idea of our education systems and things that we can fundamentally change. Because ultimately, um, through a lot of administration, not just this administration, uh, we probably haven't done enough to be on our front foot. And we have an opportunity here to be on our front foot as we think about the challenges that China uh, presents to us. And second, I, I do think this idea, and I think the minister pointed out to this and Mike just pointed out to this, and I'm sure Julie, if she could actually talk about it, would also say, um, we need to find opportunities to engage the Chinese. Listen, climate change is a fundamental um, uh, uh, potential catastrophic uh, uh, new ones coming to our country and the world, and the Chinese played a critical role in that. And as we hopefully, as as the president-elect gets sworn in and gets back into the Paris climate change, uh, we can re-engage the Chinese on this. And so we need to look for opportunities as we face the challenges. Um, to answer the question you asked me, um, uh, listen, there's no question. The single, beyond anything else that we do in the first six months of a Biden administration is get our arms around COVID. Nothing else, nothing else even goes on the radar screen because everything flows from that. And that means the economic hardship. I mean, we're all talking about the economy, you know, improving uh, for jobs uh, coming down a little bit. The reality is for, for both uh, black and brown communities and many communities are dramatically damaged and will take years to pull them out of the catastrophic situation they're currently in. So I think there is no question that everything uh, needs to be focused on COVID. That said, you have to do COVID on a multilateral basis. If I had it, there's many things I have problems with this administration on, but the idea of the idea of doing this alone has not only damaged our ability to, to work on COVID, but it also has had enormous ability for us to basically look at the world stage that we're trying to do this on our own. So I think the challenge around um, the COVID and the economic distress that this country is under is gonna be the number one issue. And number two, Obviously, that means that the administration is going to have to spend time at home, which means they're going to have to spend time on figuring out how we pass a stimulus to help states and local. Listen, the states have been devastated by this. And so as someone who not only has worked in diplomacy, but also has worked in the private sector, we've got to get our arms around how we support these states, because if we don't, the impact of the state's budgets on the people who are most in need are going to be crushed. So answering your question, can we walk and chew gum at the same time, we have no choice. And in fact, one could argue that the multilateralism will help us achieve both those outcomes. One, the distribution of a vaccine, which we've had more good news, but the distribution is gonna be an enormous challenge, not only for the United States, but for Europe uh, and Asia as well. We have to work together. And, and because as we know, one of the reasons to get this economy back together is to have travel back and forth, which has basically come to a standstill. So they have to advance the advance our abilities to do that. And so I think if we understand what our priorities are and set the foundation, what the, what's good about this report, it sets the table for what we need to do. This is not, this is not we're not gonna flip a switch and say, okay, folks, um, our bilateral relationship, China is dramatically changing on day one. It's going to take time. And one thing about Joe Biden is, Joe Biden knows how to do this and he will surround himself around people who know how to do this. And we cannot do this alone. And I think if we think about that as the, one of the themes of this report of everything you go from act urgency, urgency, uh, unilateralism, uh, can't play defense, all of these are in, in, encapsulated with, you have to do this on a multilateral basis. So I think, um, listen, I am uh, optimistic that we can get our arms around uh, COVID, but I 100% agree with you. Um, we cannot be distracted. We, the world is continuing to move forward, but we have to fix and, and get our arms around that to allow the Congress and the policymakers to also begin to pivot on the bigger issues that are facing our country after we take care uh, of what we have as a, 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 a catastrophic issue this country is facing. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, I wanna come back to Minister Sarida, but also say to Julie and Andrea, if, if at any point you guys want to, to jump in uh, and, and comment on any, uh, anything that the other panelists have said, please do. Um, Minister Sarida, um, 
Europe has adopted, and you touched on this in your opening remarks, Europe has adopted a harder line on China in recent years, I think especially this year uh, because of Hong Kong, um, because of the mass diplomacy, the wolf warriors, et cetera. Um, last year, of course, the EU described China as a systemic rival, uh, but there are still big divisions, as, as you know, uh, between the, the member states. And I think there's a reluctance in some European capitals uh, to, to alienate Beijing, to, uh, to, to uh, provoke Beijing, a reluctance to do that. Um, so one question I have for you, is Europe sufficiently united to have this discussion with a new US administration? Does Europe know what it wants from that discussion? I think you may be on mute. Now. Oh, there you are. Good. Good. <laughs> so if you go back uh, 12 to 18 months, I think you would see a much bigger discrepancy between the bigger capitals in the European Union. Um, now there is more conversion, I would say, and, and there is more I would say more united uh, analysis also uh, on this. And I think what has happened over the last year or this year has really fueled a lot of the skepticism. And you mentioned a couple of the, a couple of issues. I think it has also in a way made Europe readdress our supply chains, for instance. We saw very early on in the pandemic that we were way too dependent on on China or India for that matter, on, on single suppliers, on vital PPE or, or medication. And I think all of the, everything that has happened around the pandemic has, has really put European leaders closer together in the more strategic discussions and issues. That said, it doesn't mean that Europe does not want to engage China. And even though we're not an EU member, we are closely aligned with the EU, of course, in, in most uh, respects. And we, we stand shoulder to shoulder with the EU, for instance, in addressing human rights violations and the issues of democracy and so forth. And I raised the same issues when I had the Chinese foreign minister visiting in Oslo in August. Uh, I also raised with him the need for China to engage constructively uh, when it comes to nuclear disarmament, for instance. Um, but, but the challenge, I think, for, for many is to, to see both sides of that Chinese coin. Um, China is both the world's largest coal nation and also one of the biggest investors in renewable energy. And, and as Tom mentioned, it's impossible to deal with global climate change issues without engaging China. So, so I think that what we have seen during the past year is, is a Europe, uh, both inside and outside the European Union, being more united in seeing the challenges um, and, and also trying to be more unified in, in how to address uh, many of these issues. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm hearing a lot of talk about engagement uh, with China, um, which of course would be a, a, a shift certainly uh, if, if a new Biden administration uh, adopts that approach. Um, Mike, I want to come back to you uh, and, and talk about this summit of democracies idea. Uh, Joe Biden has said that he will convene uh, such a summit uh, next year. Um, do you think this is the right way to frame this competition as a, as a systemic conflict between democracies and authoritarian countries like China and Russia? Um, I, I, I have to laugh a little because I worked on John McCain's campaign as his Asia advisor in 2008, and he proposed this, and, um, and, uh, and the Democrats made fun of it. But I actually think it's a time, uh, it, it was probably not right at that time, to be honest. I, I was not a big fan internally in the campaign of the idea. But I think now it is... Um, it is the time to do this because of the convergence of, um, of leading democracies around the world in their concern. It should not be about China explicitly. Um, you know, we have backsliding in democracies among our friends and allies as well and at home. And so I think it's really uh, an opportunity to, uh, number one, make the case that democracies and democracy delivers. Um, for, uh, for, for, for women, for um, uh, excluded parts of society, um, for those who want um, you know, investment in a, in a rules-based economy and so forth. 
Um, and that's the that's the focus. I think the, China will get the message, <laughs> as will Russia. Tricky part is who do you invite, who do you not invite? I would I would lean more towards um, uh, those democracies that have a strong story to tell. Can I just quickly riff off that to make one point? You know, as a professor, even when I give an A plus at Georgetown, I still have comments, and I do. There is one thing in the report that's implicit, but I but I think needs to be made more explicit, and that is that. Um, too often, and I've been involved in transatlantic dialogues on China for several decades, too often the transatlantic dialogue is about China and it really should be about Asia. And um, the United States is not hedging in Asia. We are in a hot contest for supremacy in that region with China and the Chinese are explicit about it. And um, I think a, a more constructive transatlantic dialogue would have um, a focus on, um, on, on Japan on Indonesia, on Korea. Um, for example, on infrastructure, Japan's uh, infrastructure projects with Australia and the US are the leading counter to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and that's where I think the Europeans should be plugging in. Or on democracy, when I tr well, I've spent a lot of time in Myanmar and Indonesia uh, and, and, and Cambodia, when, 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 when people talk about their model for democratizing, it's, it's, it's not Germany or France, it's Korea or Indonesia. Um, so engaging on all the issues we're talking about with these countries is critical uh, for success globally, but also to help counter Chinese hegemonic ambitions in Asia. Um, and who is supporting civil society, governance, and democracy in Cambodia and in Mongolia? It's Norway. It's Denmark. It's, it's, I'm not saying the Europeans don't have a role, but the partners we need are, are there waiting for us. Um, and I think that um, I shouldn't be saying this with the Norwegian foreign minister because Norway is an exception. Norway has excellent relations with Japan, uh, two maritime states with a lot of common interests and a strong Japan studies tradition in Norway, by the way. I've, I've spent two weeks lecturing at Trondheim University. But the EU as a whole um, just too often rushes to China um, when in fact the contest globally is about the contest in Asia and there are other key players that we need to bring into this much more. I just wanted to make that point. It's implicit in the report, but I think it has to be really explicit in the transatlantic dialogue in a way that it probably hasn't been. Mike, let me just add to one other country. India is very important. Yeah, yeah. And I think we really need to really think and adjust our thinking as it relates to our focus on China. India is going to be a critical part of that in my view. Can I add one thing too, Noah, because just to get back to your question about like, is this a, a competition of systems? And I do think that we need to kind of be clear eyed about the very different visions that uh, US and European order represent and what China is proposing. I mean, China is standing up for kind of rigged economic interactions, spheres of influence, digital authoritarianism, all of these things that are so contradictory to what the United States and Europe value. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to fight it or that's the lens through which we compete with China. Um, a lot of what we talked about in the report and I think a lot of what you hear in Washington too is that getting our own house in order and doing things well on our own because it's the right thing to do is crucial to that so that we're not kind of countering what China and Ru increasingly Russia together are doing that we're doing things, we're getting our own house in order, we're strengthening our resilience, we're leveraging our assets with Europe. Um, and in that sense, that's not really a competition of systems. It's a more kind of proactive um, and I think in, in, a, in a way offensive mindset. So even though I, th I think we have to be clear that it is a competition of systems, but that doesn't mean that that's the lens through which we, we kind of engage in that competition. Noah, can I just jump in as well? Um, I just want to echo something that Mike had said and um, kind of alluded to in his opening remarks and then just touched on again, and that is the, the need for us to bring European allies, America's European allies together with allies across the Pacific. I mean, normally, as all of us know on the screen, all the folks listening, traditionally in US foreign policy, you know, you focus, you have the, the folks across the government that focus on the transatlantic relationship. And then you have the folks in another corner that are very focused on our relationships with Japan, Australia, China, other powers uh, in Asia. And what needs to happen slowly, we're seeing some evidence 
evidence of this, but Mike's making the case to do more of it, to find creative ways to bring those alliance relationships together to think about what we can do in areas like countering BRI or connectivity issues, whether it's 5G or something else, but also thinking about the broader tech piece, AI. I mean, there are roles for all of these countries to play together. And I think thinking about how we can strengthen our collective hand across the Atlantic and the Pacific will be really the best approach going forward. But that requires our government in the United States and other governments um, to do something that they're not necessarily used to doing or comfortable doing. And so the key will be going forward to find, you know, in our case here in Washington, to find, you know, the Europe hand that has some exposure, you know, to the Pacific as well, or find the Asia hand that's, you know, traveled like Mike has uh, and teaching in Europe and things like that. So you've got the perception of, you know, in some sense of how these issues are handled on both, both sides, uh, uh, both the Pacific and the Atlantic. Thanks, Julie. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for the panel discussion. Then we're going to go to Q&A. We have quite a few questions in the Q&A box, I see. Um, I wanted to come back to Tom and ask about trade. Um, if you talk to Europeans these days, uh, they believe this should be at the very top of the agenda. There's real concern about the state of the WTO, uh, about what they see as a drift towards protectionism in the US. Um, yesterday, we saw 15 Asian nations, including China, sign what will be one of the world's biggest regional trade agreements. Um, should, Tom, do you, what is your view? Should, should a new administration open this can of worms uh, that is TPP or TTIP, uh, given the skepticism in the, in the Democratic Party and in the, you know, the political establishment in general towards uh, free trade deals? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think, number one, we need to re-engage. Okay, how that transpires, I mean, maybe we want to get back into the World Trade Organization, right? Maybe we want to have a voice vis-a-vis -vis how these trade agreements are actually being implemented and how they're being enforced. So I think that's number one. And, and number two, you know, everywhere I go, people ask me the question, which I'm sure everyone on the panel and everyone in the audience here is, is the Biden administration going to do something about the China um, tariffs? Are they, going to, are they going to back away from the tariffs? That's not the question. The question is, there's got to be a framework. And one of the things, the biggest gripe that I had with the Trump administration, there doesn't seem to be a framework. It was, uh, today we're putting on um, sanctions on a particular sector, and then four days later we're going to negotiate because the Chinese have bought a bunch of agricultural products in Iowa. So not to be simplistic about this, but I think one of the things I think that the incoming Biden administration will do is has to put this um, in an, an overarching framework. And it's not just about do we have multilateral trade agreements? It's not just about what we think about uh, our, how we use trade as an enforcement mechanism, both uh, in China and uh, in, in Iran. I mean, the, the point of this is, is that one thing you'll see in this in incoming administration is there'll be a set framework and how we think about not only multilateralism, how we think about China and how we're gonna address the Chinese issues, how are we going to engage in the world around trade? So I, I, for us to debate today, should we re-engage in TPP? Listen, that, that's not the issue. The issue is going to be really about what our objective is. And I think one of the things that this report says is our objective needs to be, we need to focus on China now, okay? We can't, we can't wait for two years. We have to have a clear view of what we're trying to achieve. And one of the things I have a lot of confidence and, you know, and, and Julie can't talk about this, but the team that is working on putting this uh, chapeau, I love that word, the chapeau, chapeau together is around this idea of, of we cannot do this alone. And, and if that means um, uh, more thoughts around uh, use of the WTO, so be it. If it's about how we manage the current uh, train sanctions that are in place, also will be an interesting conversation, but it's got to be in a broader framework. And I think that's what this report talks about, but I also think what the administration will set up as we go forward in the next um, uh, three to six months. Thanks, Tom. Um, we have a lot of questions in the docket, so I suggest uh, one more question for, for Minister Sarida, and then we uh, 
move to the Q&A uh, a little bit early because uh, we do want to answer as many questions as possible from the audience. Um, so, Minister Zoraida, um, do you see any risk that, I mean, the Trump administration has, has taken a, a pretty aggressive approach to European allies. We've seen this especially in the 5G debate. Um, you know, I, I think there's a sense of, you know, that European countries have been bullied, that the diplomacy has been quite um, uh, uh, sharp-edged. Um, do you see any risk that without this intense pressure from Washington that, that we've seen in recent years from the Trump administration, uh, that Europe will perhaps shy away from confrontation with China? Or do you think we're, we're beyond that point right now? You're mute. You're on mute. I'm mute. After eight months, we still haven't learned how to do this. It's just amazing, isn't it? Well, I'll, I'll try to be better for the rest of the seminar. Well, um, let me just start by saying that, I mean, we have experienced uh, and still experience a very good bilateral cooperation with uh, with the Trump administration. That's been, I mean, for uh, for all of Norway, Norway's history, we have been cooperating very closely with the sitting American administration and different Norwegian governments. And that's the same case now. But I do think that you will see that there is a real interest among European countries uh, to engage, um, as uh, as I think uh, if it was it was Tom or Mike who said that we need to strengthen our collective hands, uh, and I think that um, to see that kind of American leadership that I that I talked about in the beginning, not kind of withdrawing from international uh, organizations or or multilateral cooperation but actually engaging in it, leaving less room and less space for China to maneuver, uh, giving more room for allies uh, and, and jointly strengthen our, our hand. It doesn't always mean that we will agree on everything, uh, but I think that there is a, a, a real willingness among European allies to, to engage strongly with the US also now. And I think you will see that when when reaching out also on this issue, there there is a there is a demand not only for leadership, but also for for engagement. And I don't think it means that European allies in any way will be more reluctant or, or do less in, in confrontation. I mean, we, as I pointed out, we have a lot of reasons for confronting China. Uh, those are reasons that serve our own national interests. And we also have a lot of reasons for engaging with China also because it serves our interests. So that will be the guiding principle still, but, but I think that it would be a, a much, I would say, stronger response if if we could do it together as as allies and just one last point when when i talk about engagement or, or hedging it's not like we come from this at a neutral angle we come from this as an ally uh, and and that's something that i always always underline in in for us like this that it is not it's not like it's um doesn't matter to us which angle this comes from. It's for us very important that the, the values, um, the policies that we've built together on multilateralism, bilaterally, that is, is guiding our, our policies on this. But we depend also on the US taking much needed leadership in, in these issues. Otherwise, the room is open. Thanks so much. OK, I think we're going to move to the Q&A to answer, uh, try to try to answer all of these questions. We have over 30 questions. So I'm going to I'm going to break it down into three uh, a piece uh, and then uh, throw those three to you guys. And whoever wants to answer them can can put their hand up. I think we do have a number of questions about this this period that we're entering entering into this interregnum, so to speak. And the risks, I think, on the one hand, that China could use this uh, this, this period to uh, assert itself. Um, we saw this on in Hong Kong uh, during the during the pandemic. Um, Taiwan is, a, is 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 a big issue that everyone's talking about. So, um, on the one hand, China asserting itself using this 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 period uh, between the Biden and the handover handover from Trump to Biden, uh, and and also there was a, there was an Axios report I think today or yesterday which which said that uh, the Trump administration was going to try to sort of uh, lock in decoupling steps uh, in the next couple months, and we've already seen a little bit of that. Um, so this is perhaps a question for Mike: um, the risks 
surrounding this, this interregnum. Another question um, about uh, Belt and Road. We've, we've touched on this, but we haven't really delved into it in any depth. Um, you know, the EU has its connectivity strategy unveiled in 2018. There are attempts to sort of uh, make that a bit more forceful right now in, in, in Brussels. I don't know if they're going to succeed. Uh, in, in, in the US, you have the IDFC, uh, the Build Act uh, came out in 2018. So US-EU cooperation on in, in, in sort of countering uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, if anyone wants to grab that one. And then maybe one, um, one other question from Ulrike Franke. Um, you know, who, who, who sh this is the Kiss Kissinger question. Who should, uh, who should Biden speak to, right? Um, should, it be, uh, should it be the EU? Should it be Berlin, Paris? Should it be Oslo? Um, uh, who, who, who should a Biden administration speak to? So I will throw those out there, and and maybe Mike could could get the interreg uh, answer the interregnum question, and then anyone else who wants to answer the others can can jump in. So, um, I I don't think that uh, that Beijing is taking advantage of the um, uh, you know the uncertainties in our uh, uh, transition and so forth. Um, I just think they're not slowing down doing what they were already doing, which is interesting because. Um, in previous transitions in previous election years, um, uh, where I've been involved as an advisor to campaigns, usually on the losing side, um, the, the, the Chinese send delegations um, and they're very careful. They don't want to become an issue in the US election. Um, this time it's different. They are not changing uh, what they're doing at all. I don't think they're increasing pressure on Hong Kong or Taiwan or India because of the election. I just think the decision has been made uh, in, in, in Beijing that there is now a bipartisan consensus in the US around strategic competition. And uh, it is what it is. And anyway, China is now strong enough. Um, and uh, on the other hand, there are several, you know, rumors out there that uh, Donald Trump will try some, you know, military move or something like that. To, uh, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't, he, there's no suggestion that, that he is um, particularly eager to to go into combat with anyone. Um, so I, I don't see that. Um, but as you point out, Noah, there is a real possibility of um, more moves by the administration to cement and decoupling, especially Commerce Department entity lists on um, exports to Huawei and others. I think those will be relatively easy for a Biden administration to undo because they're executive orders, but politically, um, you know, they get attacked for doing it. So I think it has to be done in alignment. This is one more issue. It's in the report. It has to be done in alignment with Europe and key um, Asia Pacific allies, so that we have a technology policy and a, and a framework, as Tom would say, um, for doing this. I, and, that, um, and that will be possible. I think tariffs will be a little harder politically for a Biden administration. Uh, polls show a majority of Americans support trade, a majority of Americans support TPP, but presidential elections are being decided by tens of thousands of votes in you know, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, where, where you know, skepticism of trade is strongest. And so I think reduce, re reversing tariffs is trickier, but the executive orders on technology exports, that's doable, but only if we have a clear framework with allies and partners to do it. So that, there's the urgency that, that's pointed to in this report around tech. We partly need it for our own domestic decision-making. No, can I just foot stomp one thing that Mike said, because I think it's really important. Um, one thing we all know, the Chinese are very sophisticated, okay? And one thing we know, they're watching Joe Biden. Okay, Joe Biden is not a new person on the map, okay? He has lived these issues and he has surrounded himself with a bunch of very sophisticated foreign policy hands. So they're gonna be very cautious of figuring out how a right, the wrong foot to get off with, on, on these people. So this is not like, this is not a Donald Trump administration with a bunch of newbies around. These are, these are sophisticated people who understand the US-China relationship so I, I have not, I have very little anxiety that, listen, sure, there'll be some skirmishes, some of the, some of the, the Trump, whatever the Trump wants to do in the next 60 days will get reversed. But I think that they are going to take this administration, this new incoming administration, very seriously in a very sophisticated way because they know what they're dealing with. And I think that's a very strong message that not only is uh, 
President-elect Biden expressing in his comments, but just the people that are already around not only the transition, um, but also um, who will ultimately be in some of these roles. Thanks, uh, Tom. Um, so two other questions, response to BRI, uh, transatlantic cooperation on that, and you know, who, who should uh, a new U.S. administration, who, sh who should they be talking to uh, in Europe? Um, does I anyone want to? Yeah, I can jump in on the Belt and Road because we do identify that as a, an, a potential area for cooperation in the report. And we highlighted a couple of ideas. I mean, broadly speaking, speaking, one of the things we flagged is that in many of the countries where China is giving these loans, there is not a lot of expertise on China. Um, and that a lot of times governments and other actors aren't fully aware of all of the common pitfalls that are associated with Chinese investment in those in those countries. And so we, what we've highlighted in the report is a couple of things. One is we can work together to jointly build expertise on China and some of these countries. Uh, we can also work together, the United States and Europe, to do joint consultations with governments that are considering Chinese investment so that we can flag for them some of the common pitfalls that are associated with those investments. Um, we also highlight um, the potential to, to at least align uh, some of our investments. It's going to be difficult. I mean, it's you know probably a fool's errand to try to compete with the magnitude of what the Belt and Road Initiative is. But if we can come to some kind of common agreement about strategically important countries or investment projects that both the United States and Europe would like to see, being able to do those together, if we can align investments in third countries, and in even better, when we do that, if we can bring in some countries from outside of the transatlantic partnership in the Indo-Pacific, for example. So working together to, to align investments in those countries. And then broadly speaking is just kind of the, the information environment in which these investments are being made in. Um, just doing more work to make people uh, more aware, again, of those common pitfalls, highlighting the corrupt practices that often go along, the predatory investment schemes, uh, the environmental implications of some of these investments. The United States and Europe could, it could do better together to kind of shape that information environment. So I think all of those things together would at least present some um, headwinds to Belt and Road or at least mitigate the impacts that we don't, that we don't want to see. Thanks, Andrea. Oh, yeah. there, there, Noah, there. could I pitch in with just one Go thing? Ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, as most of you know, we're not part of the Belt and Road Initiative. We're just, in a way, watching it from, from the outside. But I think we just have to remember the history here of the financial crisis where China were able to uh, make investments um, in many countries with weak economies. Right now, uh, we see that there is a huge, not only understanding, but willingness from the EU as a collective to actually form packages of economic recovery of uh, the European Green Deal, which now is the backbone of the economic recovery with enormous funding, meaning also that politically the EU is, is much closer aligned with itself right now on how to get out of this crisis that comes from, from the COVID-19. And I say this as a non-EU member, but as a country who is, of course, closely working together um, with the EU. And I think that it's, um, of course, I, I would always say that Joe Biden should talk to Oslo. That would be my primary point of view, of course. <laughs> but, but in addition to that, I, I think that um, an American administration now, be it a continued Trump administration for a couple more months or the, the incoming Biden administration, uh, I think should see that in the EU right now and in Europe, uh, there is maybe a potential for forging a stronger partnership just because the EU now has come more more strongly together in the response of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the the rest response of, of what is now a part of the financial crisis that, that some European countries still are dragging along into the pandemic. So, so I think there are enormous opportunities in, in reaching out to Europe here and start with Oslo, of course. Thank you. Julie, do you wanna take the, um, the Kissinger question? Yeah, the who to call. Um, 
I think what's really interesting in this town is just to watch um, kind of how folks across the city have been talking about the EU ever since it came out and called China a systemic rival. I mean, despite the fact that the Trump administration had labeled the EU an economic foe and had a very scratchy relationship with the EU, particularly in the, in the trade space, I think Congress, the press, multiple think tanks on both sides of the aisle, there's been increased interest in collaborating and cooperating with the EU because of the work that it's done, not just in the investment screening space, but really across the full range of subjects that are covered in our report. I mean, it's been very forward leaning in the digital and tech space. It's been forward leaning uh, most recently, you know, in the trade and investment space. We've seen some interesting statements put out even in the human rights uh, arena. And so I think for all those reasons, increasingly, you know, Americans tend to say Europe, NATO, you know, that's kind of where we go in our headspace, particularly the folks in Washington that are focused on national security, but even Americans, you know, uh, across the country, I think you say Europe, but we work through NATO. That remains a cornerstone and the foundation of our relationship, but you do see kind of the EU coming into the conversation more and more. And so I think what you'll see going forward is a greater emphasis on that EU-US relationship um, for all the obvious reasons. Great. Um, we only have about five minutes left, so I'm going to throw a few uh, extra questions out there. And I'm so sorry that we weren't able to answer. We're not going to be able to answer all of them. There are uh, well over 30 in there. Um, one, uh, the end of the Merkel era. How is that going to change things? We, we have a, a federal election in Germany uh, next year, uh, a bunch of state elections. Um, obviously, Germany, the biggest, biggest, biggest economy in Europe has, has taken a leading role in, uh, in, in, in the transatlantic relationship and, and how, how could this, how could this change, but political, these political changes in Germany affect things. Um, Europe's push for strategic autonomy, could that hurt uh, uh, efforts to forge a, a transatlantic uh, consensus on China? And perhaps uh, a last question, because I don't wanna, don't wanna uh, uh, give you guys too many, but but this this idea of uh, climate change, um, this idea of en engaging with China on on climate change, and I think I think that begs the question, you know, uh, do you make compromises in other areas in order to get China to move on climate change? I think it would be helpful, I think, to hear from uh, some of our panelists about how they see this this conversa conversation with China on on climate change. Um, so I will, I will throw that out there. End of the Merkel era, European strategic autonomy, talks with China on climate change. Does anyone wanna put up their hand for any of those? I see Mike. Um, as the Asia guy in the panel, I will not answer, answer the post Merkel question, um, but let me quickly on climate change absolutely underlined capitals exclamation point absolutely no do not trade other issues to get cooperation on climate change at the at the transition to the obama administration there was a report put out by a think tank that is not gmf or csis or cnas arguing that um u.s china relations could be managed if we cooperate on climate change climate change was seen as a way to to sort of you know soften china and <clears throat> um I don't think anyone in the current transition thinks that. We've learned our lesson. Um, you have to approach these issues on their merits. And if we lead Beijing to think we're willing to back off on defending Taiwan or back off on human rights to get China to do what's in China's interests, reduce emissions, we will lose control of the strategy and Congress will punish the administration badly. And I think everyone knows that full well. So the answer to that one is no. Um, and on European strategic autonomy, there are issues with respect to NATO and military interoperability, which I'll set aside. But as a general trend in global affairs right now, it's interesting because in Japan, which under Abe was extremely close to the Trump administration on security, technology, diplomacy, the, the debate in Japan now after our election is, you know, the Americans might do that again. Trumpism is not dead. What do we do in Japan to secure a global order? Work with Europe. That's what people are saying in Tokyo now. Work with Europe. And my response has been, good, please work with Europe. We want these nodes to be connecting to stabilize the international order. 
Um, so if strategic autonomy, I'll let Julie and others address whether it hurts NATO interoperability, but as a general prospect, if, if Europe has agency, if Europe is working with Japan, with Australia, with Canada, that is not bad for the United States, in my view. We, we are all pushing for the same kind of uh, system. I mean, let me I just-, just, let me, let me just really, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Pam, you go no, no, ahead. Please, no, no, go, please, please. I'll just be very quick on the strategic autonomy thing. I think there's a lot of discussion about how to, um, that more strategic autonomy could be a good thing for the United States. If Europe is doing more to provide for its own security and defense, it not only frees up the United States to do more in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so, so as long as there is still coordination, I think looking forward, we could see more encouragement, fewer roadblocks, fewer barriers to European efforts to do more for their own security and defense, just for the reasons that Mike said, that uh, that, that is actually a good thing for the United States. Uh, and it is a, a net benefit in terms of what we're talking about today, addressing China. It allows the United States to, to focus on the Indo-Pacific. Um, and, and I think it is something that uh, is likely to be encouraged in the future, as long as it's done in coordination with the United States. And I was just going to agree with Mike on, on, you can never compromise your core values. But I think one of the things about this report really did emphasize, we do need to find common ground with the Chinese. And one of the areas we can find common ground is on climate change. And if we're going to get move on that, which is a critical point of the incoming Biden administration, we need to use that as a tool to help us get the broader issues. Right. Could I just pitch in with, with the small thing there? Because uh, I think it's important to remember that the discussion in Europe or the European Union about the strategic autonomy issue, it started um, more or less with defense issues. And, and I think that the cooperation now between NATO and the EU has been better on division of labor, on Europe taking more responsibility for our own security. But it has translated now into the discussion of what happens with the consequences of the pandemic. So now the strategic autonomy discussion is as much about not being too dependent on supply chains or one specific distributor of, of PPE, for instance. So it's, it has now a much, much wider uh, perspective than it had only a year or two ago. So um, what started out to be potentially a bit of a competition or, or building or what to say, establishing parallel structures of, of NATO and the EU has now become something that I think more, uh, more countries can subscribe to. And it is not at all uh, in, in conflict with uh, a greater um, Europe-US cooperation on this. On the contrary, I think it is also serving US interests uh, because it has to do with being less dependent on some of the bigger actor, actors like China from, from the European side. And I think just just one uh, one last point. I think it's I think it's important for you to know that that in Europe, um, the bipartisan nature of the need to confront China from the U.S. side is widely understood. So I don't think anyone is walking around now thinking that things will be very different with the Biden Biden administration. Uh, I'm just looking for ways where we can um, align our, our forces, our, our good forces, uh, in the best possible way. And that's when I think the balance between engagement and hedging is, is good. Thank you so much. Um, well, we're already three minutes over, so I feel obliged to wrap it up. We haven't answered the end of the Merkel era question, but uh, maybe the Merkel era will, will continue, you know, ad infinitum um, as, as it has uh, over the past uh, 15 years. Um, so uh, I think we've heard a lot of excellent ideas about how the U.S. and Europe can cooperate with each other on the China challenge. Um, it's not going to be easy. Uh, that's pretty clear. Uh, the new administration is going to be confronted with a lot of domestic and international uh, uh, challenges. Uh, Europe is still smarting from four years of, of, of Donald Trump. And I think despite the convergence that we've seen over the past years, Europe and the US still have their differences on how best to confront China. But I think what we've all agreed here today is uh, that time is of the essence uh, and that there is no real alternative to closer transatlantic cooperation, no matter how difficult uh, it may prove. Uh, I want to thank all our speakers, uh, Julie and Andrea, for presenting this great report. 
uh, Minister Sarida for uh, dialing in from, from Norway, uh, and Mike and Tom uh, for, for participating as well. Uh, I also want to thank GMF and CNAS for hosting this event. Uh, and I, especially I want to thank everybody who dialed in and, and, and bombarded us with so many questions that we weren't able to answer. I apologize for that. Um, thanks to everyone uh, and have a great week. Thank you, congrats on the report. Thank you. Thank you.